It's July 1643, and England is mired in civil war between King and Parliament. Royalist troops under Prince Rupert of the Rhine have assembled outside the city of Bristol, having swept aside an opposing parliamentarian army at the Battle of Roundway Down. They now stand poised to storm the city, capture the West Country for the King, and crush Parliament's hopes of a quick victory over their royalist foes. At the beginning of 1643, the parliamentarians were in a strong position. Having avoided defeat at the Battle of Edgehill the previous year, Parliament had amassed a huge army in southeast England, making any cavalier attacks on London impossible. The King was forced back to Oxford for the winter in a somewhat precarious situation. In the southwest, the parliamentarians had pushed royalist troops under Ralph Hopton into Cornwall and held Bristol and the large counties of Somerset and Devon. However, Parliament's hold on many of these western counties was tenuous at best, more to do with royalist weakness than their own strength. Through the winter, Hopton marshalled a small but effective royalist army in Cornwall, preparing to launch an offensive to regain territory he was forced to give up the previous autumn. Aged 47, Hopton was an experienced and excellent commander, having fought in Europe during the Thirty Years' War. In May, he began his advance, skirting the Cornwall-Devon border with his small army trying to draw Parliament's troops out. Before long, the Earl of Stamford responded to the Royalist movements, marching west with his own army of 5,000 men. On the night of May 17th, whilst encamped near to the village of Stratton, Stamford's men were encircled unseen through the night by Hopton and his army, before being ambushed at dawn. After a day of heavy fighting, Stamford's army had suffered a terrible defeat, losing almost 2,000 men dead and taken prisoner. Wasting no time to bask in their victory, the Royalists overran most of Devon and drove east, bypassing strong parliamentarian garrisons at Exeter and Plymouth in order to surge into Somerset. Presented with the chance to radically shift the balance of power in the west, the Royalists dispatched an experienced brigade of cavalry commanded by Prince Maurice to attempt to link up with Hopton. On June 4th, the two Royalist armies met at Chard in Somerset, and with their combined numbers swept the parliamentarians from most of the county, capturing important centres like Taunton and Wells. Alert to the cavalier threat, Parliament scrambled to assemble an army capable of matching Hopton's 6,000 troops, ordering an army south from Worcestershire to reinforce the very small standing army Parliament had left in Somerset. Setting up base at Bath, Parliament's reinforcements had little respite before Hopton resumed his advance, crossing the River Avon on July 2nd at Bradford and pushing north. Circling around the city to block their opponent's line of retreat, Hopton faced the Parliamentarian army on Lansdowne Hill, northwest of Bath. Commanding his opponents was Sir William Waller, a highly regarded commander and a very close friend of Ralph Hopton. The two men had fought side by side in the armies of the Palatinate in the early 1620s, but now found themselves on opposite sides. Shortly before joining battle, they wrote to each other, lamenting that they must fight this war without an enemy out of deeply held ideas of duty to their respective causes. When the two sides joined battle, they were equally matched, and both sides took heavy losses in a day of inconclusive fighting. The Royalists came off worse, including a bad injury to Hopton himself. His battered, leaderless army was forced to retreat to Devizes in Wiltshire, and the remaining Royalist cavalry were sent to Oxford in search of reinforcements. Sensing victory, Waller pressed home his advantage, bringing his remaining 5,500 troops to lay siege to the town. Only a few days later, on July 13th, hope arrived for the Royalists. 1800 fresh cavalry, commanded by Henry Wilmot, approached the town and Waller drew his whole army up to face them on Roundway Down, an area of high ground north of Devizes that forced Wilmot's cavalry to attack uphill. Waller hoped to defeat the oncoming relief force 
before the garrison from Devizes could attack his rear. Ignoring their numerical and geographical disadvantage, the Royalist cavalry charged at the flanks of Waller's army, shattering his cavalry with one thunderous attack. Desperate to get away, many parliamentarians blindly charged down the steep slopes of the down, and dozens fell to their deaths, in particular over the edge of a steep precipice now known as the Bloody Ditch. The parliamentary infantry, led by Waller himself and now horribly exposed, stood fast, and for over an hour withstood repeated charges from the Royalist horse. Only when Royalist infantry from Devizes reached Roundway were they put to flight, and again, many were driven over the impossibly steep slopes, the bloody ditch. Utterly routed, Waller was left with no choice but to retreat to Bristol, and by the time he assembled what was left of his army there, it numbered no more than 1,000 men. It was one of the most decisive engagements of the entire civil war. With the parliamentarian field army destroyed, a golden chance to take control of the entire southwest now presented itself, and the royalists were not slow to take advantage. Only a few days after Roundway, Prince Rupert left Oxford with most of the king's main army, combining with the western army now under the command of his younger brother, Prince Maurice, to create an army of around 15,000 men. They surrounded Bristol on July 23rd and faced a small garrison of just over 2,000 men, led by the city's governor, Nathaniel Fiennes. Three days later, rather than fight a lengthy siege, Rupert decided to storm the town. The Royalists' plan was simple. Simultaneous attacks from the south by Prince Maurice's men and from the north by Prince Rupert would overwhelm and confuse the defenders and deliver victory. The battle, however, was anything but simple. Within the first hour, Maurice's attack was thrown into chaos when all three commanders of his attacking columns were killed amid heavy casualties, leading several units to begin to falter. Only Maurice's personal intervention managed to bolster his men's morale enough to keep them in the fight. In the north, the Royalists fared somewhat better. After two hours of heavy fighting, Rupert's men made a breakthrough with the seizure of two Royalist forts in the northwest, piercing the parliamentarian defence ring. Wasting no time in pressing forts into the Bristol suburbs, the fighting devolved into close quarters street fighting. Progress was made, but slowly and at enormous cost. After six hours of fighting, almost a quarter of the Royalist army was dead or wounded. By this time, Maurice's attack on the south had entirely collapsed, and his best troops were called north to help his brothers advance. Rupert's main army inched closer to the River Froome, aiming to take the bridge over it at the Froome Gate, but morale was shaky and some units were on the verge of breaking. For the parliamentarians though, Fiennes seemed to believe that the Royalists were in much better shape than they actually were, and he gave orders to pull as many men back across the river as possible even with little idea what to do once that had been achieved. After a couple of hours of indecision, he eventually mounted a counter-attack, which began just after 10am. Morale was so low among royalists at this point that several tried to surrender to the parliamentarians, but Fiennes could not bring himself to fully commit to this attack, and most troops were pulled back after only a half hour or so. Seeing more and more royalist troops pushing their way towards him, and unaware of how bad morale was in some cavalier units, Fiennes believed his position to be hopeless. Before midday, he requested a ceasefire and signalled his intention to surrender the city, to the fury of many of his men. At dawn the following day, after Fiennes had managed to enforce the ceasefire with some difficulty among his unruly troops, Bristol was surrendered to Prince Rupert. Bristol's surrender was a heavy blow to the Roundheads, and it greatly strengthened the King's position. A firmly royalist West Country was a sizeable asset, both in terms of manpower and money. Parliament knew this, and it was furious with Bristol's loss. Fiennes' decision to surrender was to almost cost him his head. Waller, however, escaped lightly, as the Earl of Essex was blamed for allowing the Royalists to dispatch troops from Oxford 
to attack Waller at Roundway Down. The summer of 1643 was a high point for the Royalists that they would never reach again. The Southwest was in firmly Royalist hands and the King's men had just defeated Sir Thomas Fairfax at the Battle of Adwalton Moor in Yorkshire. With increased economic resources, King Charles could fight on, extending the Civil War into 1644 and beyond. <laughs> 